Hey, I asked David to specifically sing that song because today, I know it's out of time, I know it's out of the, uh, the, the lectionary, but we're going to do it anyway. Uh, I'm going to talk about the two road, the men on the road to Emmaus in uh, Luke 24. Now, there are many cliches I could use to begin the sermon, and many, maybe even a few jokes that I might be able to relate to that and maybe get a giggle or two out of you, but I'm actually going to start with a true, hopefully humorous story. So, to quote Sophia Petrillo from the Golden Girls, picture it, Tokyo, 1985, okay? That's where I was. A group of eight singers are traveling all over Japan, singing at different churches, mainly Lutheran, because the people who sponsored us into that country for us uh, were all Lutherans, and the missionary who took us around was also a Lutheran pastor. So, we're traveling from this youth hostel, we just finished our tour, going from this youth hostel in, on one side of Tokyo to a big Lutheran church on the other side of Tokyo. Problem. No transportation. So we've got lots of equipment. We have to take all of our uh, personal belongings, all of the, um, you know, when you go on a trip like that, you get a ton of souvenirs. All of that had to get over there as well. So I actually had been to that Lutheran church earlier in our tour uh, just to introduce myself to the head of the Lutheran Church in Tokyo, and uh, that was based out of that church. So it was decided that we would take taxis, Ooh. and we loaded every piece of equipment and every scrap of clothing and everything that we had into one, um, one taxi and put me in it. The missionary told the guy where to go, gave them the address and everything, and off we ran. The others were going to follow in a couple more taxis, or maybe even if it was a van, but they were going to follow and meet me there. So as we're traveling around, we're on, we're on the road, I'm just kind of looking around and thinking, you know, this, this is really interesting. I love traveling in, in foreign countries because there's just this slight difference. A lot of the buildings look like ours, but there's this slight difference between their construction and their architecture that I love to see. And so I am just looking all around, just enjoying all of this. And I'm also looking for landmarks so that I can recognize where I'm at and see if we're going to the right place. So our wonderful, illustrious, industrious taxi driver pulls up to this ancient church that I have never seen before in my life. And he said, we're here. Well, I assume that's what he said. He said it in Japanese. And he got out and started unloading everything onto the sidewalk right there. And I'm trying to explain to him, no, this is not the place. Of course, his, his English is only slightly worse than my Japanese. I at least could say, well, how to design this. But I don't think he could say hello. But uh, anyway, uh, boom. As soon as his that taxi was empty, he was off. And I'm like, okay, I don't know where in the world I am, what is going to happen. And uh, so I can't, I, I have to admit, I was just a little bit scared, you know. Uh, so I'm looking around and thinking, okay, God, what do I do now? So I walked up to this ancient church, and it's a huge door almost like a cathedral door, but not quite. I knocked on the door, and this little door opens up in the, in the door, and a nun looks out. She doesn't speak English either. And so she said, no, 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 and closes it in my face. <laughs> so I continue knocking, and it's obvious that she's not going to answer again, and I'm on my own, whatever that means. So I'm thinking, okay. <laughs> they have no idea where I'm at. I have no idea where I'm at. I've got everybody's everything. What am I supposed to do? So, I, there's this pile of equipment and luggage on the sidewalk, and I'm thinking, I have to go somewhere. I have to do something to try to find someone who at least can speak 
English so that I can get to the right place. And so I'm, I, I'm, I'm like, okay, God, watch over all of this. I have to go. So I just, I, I look back and forth on the street and I think, well, that element looks slightly better than this area. That looks more familiar. So I started going there. What about a block and a half when around the corner came one of, the, one of our group, they were out looking for me. They were canvassing the whole thing. And the relief on Sylvia's face, when she saw me, she's like, where have you been? And so, of course, I relate all of that. Now, I, I relate that story because uh, there I was in a strange land, in a strange town, in a strange section of town. And I had absolutely no clue where I was. And yet, I was scared. I'm not so much for my safety, but for the equipment, for, uh, for the, uh, the luggage. And also, bear in mind that when we were in Indianapolis, the church where we had sung was broken into the, that night, and all of our equipment was stolen. We had to get completely brand new equipment at that point. So yes, I was afraid of that most of all because I don't think our home office would have appreciated losing all of that again. So, um, there I was, and I had to make a decision, so I made it, and I started to travel. I got back on the road to search for what was going on. And here are these two men on the road to Emmaus. They're traveling, it's, uh, you know, it's Sabbath, so uh, the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus is, is not too long of a trip for the Jewish people to, 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 to take and not, um, not break the Sabbath. So they, uh, they continued on. Now, after all of the things that had happened, imagine the fear that might have been in their hearts. Their leader was just murdered. All of their friends were scattered. What was going to happen? How was everything going to happen? What were they doing there? Well, what did the future hold for them? But they got on the road. I don't know what their purpose was to going to a mass, but they got on the road and they did something. They moved. And it was while they were moving that things started to happen. Now, um, one of the things about, um, about being on the move as a person, as an organization, as a church, is it's a lot easier to steer something that's actually moving. Okay, so let's say you moor a, a boat in a harbor, and you want to go from point A to point B, but you don't put your sails up, you don't turn your motor on, you don't get your oars out, you don't do any of that stuff. You just say, God, get me over here. It's not going to happen, is it? It's not going to happen because you have to do so. You have to be moving in order for you, for you to steer yourself over to where you want to go. And I think that sometimes in churches, we have to realize that you have to be moving as a church in order for God to steer you along the way that God wants you to go. Because if you're not moving, you're standing still. A rudder on the, on the ship that's not moving is useless. So we need to be moving. And we've got an excellent opportunity coming up for us next Saturday. We're having a I'll call it church retreat for lack of a better word. But we're having that next Saturday here at the church downstairs where we can discuss how do we get moving and what is the direction we want to be moving and how do we want to identify ourselves as we are moving. But the point is we want to be moving. And we need your help for that. So if there's any way that you can Clear your schedule for next Saturday and next Sunday. We're after church. We're having a potluck, and we're going to be 
discussing some other things as far as that, um, uh, that decision. Let's, uh, you know, please, please be there. We need your input. We need you to help us determine what, uh, for lack of a better word, what the will of God is for United University Baptist Church. So, now, you know, uh, doing something. How many of you read Weird Church when we did that study a few years ago? Okay. Then you'll remember the one church where the pastor decided he wasn't going to be in the church. He was going to be out on the streets. And what he did was he, um, he went up to people who were homeless. He didn't preach to them. He didn't give them the, the uh, four spiritual laws. Thank God. Um, he didn't do any of that. He sat down with them. And he talked with them. And he found that in talking with these people, he was meeting Jesus. That Jesus was out there in these people's lives, in their stories. And he found out that these people really had a lot to offer the community in terms of their talents, in terms of their organizational abilities, all kinds of different things. And one person was very good at gardening, and so the pastor, uh, pastor organized him into formulating a, a garden for the community. That's Jesus showing us what we're supposed to be doing. That's Jesus showing the pastor what to do. Now, when I was in seminary, one of the things that we were able to do, um, we uh, took a trip one May, one, yeah, one May, was my second year, I think it was, and um, we took a trip to New York City, and we learned about ministry in the inner city. And um, you know, the the leader who greeted us in his opening remarks said, you know, many people like to go out to the country to meet God and see the beautiful creation, all the flowers and all the leaves and all the trees and the beautiful blue sky. He said, but that's not necessarily where God is. He said, if, if humanity is the apex of God's creation, then shouldn't we find God in the center where there's most of his creation? And that's the big city. And I thought that was really interesting. You know, um, I'm not saying that God isn't here with us today because I believe he is. Absolutely. And when I look out at this church, I see Jesus in each and every one of your faces. And it touches me. It touches me deeply. But I don't think we realize what we've got. And so until we get out there into the neighborhood, into the university, wherever it might be, we, and start using what we've got, Sometimes we don't realize what we've got. I do remember one time, um, back when my car was at work and I was taking the bus everywhere. Uh, one Sunday morning, I took the bus and overshot my, um, my stop. So I had to get off the next stop, come across the street, to catch the next bus and come down. And as I was, um, as I was waiting for the bus, this African-American man came dancing up to the uh, bus stop. I mean, he was happy. And it, you could tell that it was a genuine happy. I mean, he wasn't on drugs. He wasn't drunk. He wasn't anything like that. He was genuinely happy. And so I, I thought, okay, Frank, let's put, your, let's put your money where your mouth is. And so I said, well, somebody's having a good day. And he goes, you bet I am. And I said, well, what's going on? He said, Today's my birthday, I'm 36 years old. And I said, well, happy birthday, that's fantastic. Congratulations. He goes, oh, you don't know half of it. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, I'm 36. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, that means I beat the death penalty. And I said, what? He said, that's what they say. If a black man makes it to 36, he's beat the death penalty. Now, has that ever, Charmaine, 
Okay, you, you guys may have heard of this, but I know for me, that was so far removed from my experience, I was incredulous. And I was, I know you're not going to believe this, I was speechless. <laughs> that's, that's not something that happens very often to me either, but I was speechless. But you know what? I've been using that story for the last few years whenever it's time to just raise a little bit of awareness in the world. Uh, I have friends on Facebook, I have friends at work. Uh, sometimes little, little things come out of their mouth and I think, you know, maybe this is a teachable moment. And I relate that story to them. And it always gives them something to think. I want to be able to share that so that people can think about what they're saying, think about what they're doing, think about how we're reacting to people who are different from us. And I hope we can stop it, because it needs to be stopped. That's where you and I can. We're the ones that can be on for stopping the violence, stopping the prejudice, stopping the phobia, no matter what you put before that word. We need to stop it, whether it's homophobia, racophobia, you name it, we need to stop it now. It's not at a point where we can wait until some point in the future. We need to stop it now. We need to be active in stopping it now. So what I what I think is, as we're on the road, and as we're doing something on the road, let's keep our eyes open. Mom and Dad, uh, after, well, Mom and Dad were married 56 years before Dad, Dad passed away. But long before that, they had developed this traveling uh, thing in the car. Dad was behind the wheel, and uh, Mom maneuvered the car. Let me explain that. Dad was like, oh, okay, look at there. There's, look at all those cows. <laughs> oh, that's an interesting sign. I've never seen anything like that. You know, and, and Mom is sitting next to him going, Bill, there's a car in front of you. <laughs> and so, you know, Dad's eyes were open, but he just wasn't focusing on the right thing. Mom's eyes were definitely open, and she was, and she was definitely focusing on the right thing. Well, we need to be focusing on the right, to, right thing as well. Because I know for sure we can see the problems that are out there. But are we focusing on the right thing? Are we saying, as, uh, as uh, was asked Jesus, are these people in this position because of some sin that they did or some sin that uh, perhaps their parents did? And Jesus' answer was, there was no sin involved. These guys are in this situation so that God can be glorified. And that's what we need to do. We need to go out and touch these people so that God can be glorified. No judgments, no, uh, no reprimation, recriminations, none of that. Just make sure that as you relate to these people who are different from you in whatever way, Make sure that you are letting God be glorified. So, a closing story that I'd like to relate is the fact that I know we have that ability as a church. There was one Sunday, um, oh, this has been quite a few years ago now, right uh, but there was one Sunday when a, a woman was dressed as though she were home this night. Maybe she was, maybe she wasn't, I don't know. But she came to our came into our sanctuary during or not a sanctuary, but a narthex, uh, during our fellowship time. And one of our members greeted her warmly and sat her down at the table, asked her if she wanted anything to eat, told her what we had. She went over and got the plate and put it down and then sat down and talked with the woman. Just talked. And later on on Facebook, I was thinking about that and I thought, I saw Jesus today. Jesus walked 
to to learn our things. And then Jesus fed Jesus and talked to Jesus. So I, we have it in our folks. It's just a matter of taking that first step, opening our eyes and taking that first step. Jesus once said that let anyone who has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, I want to paraphrase that by saying, let anyone who has eyes, let him see. Let's look. Now, the uh, response of him is not really a hymn, it's more of a chorus. But you'll see the, uh, the words there in the end of reflection, open our eyes, Lord. Some of you may already know this. It's, it's a fairly, uh, fairly popular song in many circles. So, uh, you know, David, if you would uh, sing chorus once, and then we'll stand.